Hello and welcome to module 6.4. So in this video, we are going to look at one of the other global navigation satellite systems. And we choose GLONASS as the first other one to look at because it was the first fully operational system after GPS. So GLONASS is also an acronym like GPS. It's a, it's a Russian acronym that stands for Global Navigation Satellite System. And uh, it's operated entirely by the Russian Federation. And its orbits are very similar to GPS, as we show here in this picture. We've got GPS there, as we discussed two videos ago, and then GLONASS at a slightly lower orbit. So now when we go look at an animation like we did before, I'm going to show you GPS, just as before, the same GPS satellite that we looked at uh, two videos ago, and a GLONASS satellite as well. So as we mentioned before, with these videos, pay attention to where the satellite starts. There's the GPS and there's the GLONASS. And we'll run this simulation. And this is going to run through two orbits of the GPS system. So basically, one sidereal day of the Earth. The Earth will spin around once in the simulation. So let's watch. So you see the satellites orbiting at about the same rate. And after one sidereal day, North America is back where it started, and everywhere else on Earth is back. The GPS satellite is back where it started, but the GLONASS satellite is not where it started. It started over here. And it's completed more than two orbits. It's hiding here behind the Earth right now. So, so after one day, after one sidereal day, the GPS satellite is apparently back where it started from the point of view of anybody on Earth. But the GLONASS satellite is not. It's, if you saw that satellite a day ago from somewhere in South America, you're not going to see it anymore. It's round over by Australia. So, that, that's, that makes sense because you uh, learnt about Kepler's, uh, Kepler's laws and Kepler's third law. Let's write it out. It's so important. Kepler 3 says that the orbital period of an orbit is proportional to the semi-major axis. The orbital period squared is proportional to the semi-major axis cubed. And GLONASS has a slightly smaller semi-major axis. Therefore, it must have a smaller period, i.e. it completes an orbit quicker. And that's what you saw in this simulation. So that raises the question then, how long does it take for the apparent orbit of a GLONASS satellite to repeat itself? So we, we start this little table, and we'll build on this as we go. And we're looking at the orbit period, which is how long it takes the satellite to go back where it was in space, in inertial space. And the apparent orbit, which is how long does it take the satellite to get back to where it seemed to be from your point of view somewhere on Earth. So with GPS, it was nice and simple. It, the orbit period is half a sidereal day. So after one sidereal day, everything would be back where it started. And that was very easy to work out. So now we have this question, well, if the what, what is the orbit period of GLONASS? Well, it, it turns out it is 8 seventeenths of a sidereal day. And it was, its orbit of 19,100 kilometers was chosen to give it this integer fraction of, of an, a sidereal day for the orbit. So you can see by looking at that, it's about a half. It's, it's, it's an integer fraction. They couldn't choose a half because the GPS was already there. So they chose something slightly less than a half, 8 seventeenths, where it's integer numbers on each side of the fraction. So why did they do that? Well, we're going to see. But before we see that, we'll ask ourselves, if an orbit period is 8 seventeenths of a sidereal day, how long does it take before the apparent orbit repeats? And I'm going to let you think about that for a little bit. And so here's a multiple choice quiz. How many? What is the repeat period for the apparent orbit of a satellite with an orbit period of 8 seventeenths? So welcome back. Uh, by now, you would have discovered that the answer to the little quiz was 8 sidereal days. And if you got that straight away, 
congratulations. I've been uh, teaching this for several years and in classroom situation, almost nobody gets this answer right away because it's, it's quite hard to think about the way the question was phrased. And so this is one of those examples where it's sometimes, if you're struggling with the answer, first of all, you're in the majority. Most people don't get this right away. And it's a case where it's more important to ask the right question than to struggle for the right answer. And the, the, the direct question, how long does it take to repeat, wasn't really the right question. The right question to ask yourself, and if you forget the answer in the future, just think of the right question. The right question is this. Let's choose green for correct. So how long does it, let's suppose there's some, uh, some general satellite, never mind GLONASS for the moment, suppose satellite X with some altitude Y and some integer orbit period, M over N sidereal days. Now suppose that's so, of course you can see GLONASS is one such example where M is eight, N is 17. So for any such satellite, how long does it take that satellite X to do n orbits? Well, that's now quite a simple question. Well, each orbit takes m over n over day multiplied by n is equal to m days. By days, of course, I mean sidereal days. So that was an easy answer because I asked the right question. So I can fill in here m, and then of course in here it's eight, and there you go. And so let's interpret that a little bit. What happens over eight days? In eight days, a GLONASS satellite completes 17 orbits exactly, and the Earth spins on its axis eight times exactly. And so everything is back where it started. So if you see a GLONASS satellite in the sky, a day later you're not gonna see it in the same place as the sky. You, you're gonna have to wait eight days for the whole thing to repeat. So GPS got the best parking spot in terms of repeatability, and GLONASS went and chose an integer fraction so that even though their system didn't repeat every day, it at least repeats approximately every week. So that's the simple theory of it. Let, let's go and look at the same simulation we looked at before, but I've taken away the GPS satellite. We'll just look at the GLONASS satellite and we'll let it do 17 orbits and see what happens. So take note of where it begins. And now we'll run the simulation and we'll count the orbits. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. There's seventeen orbits exactly, and notice that North America is back where it started. So now let's pay attention to North America. So let's put an arrow to there, to that, I guess that's uh, Newfoundland in Canada. And now we'll run that simulation again and let's count how many times the Earth rotates. So we're counting sidereal days here. So let's go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And everything's back where it started. So you saw eight sidereal days exactly coinciding with 17 orbits, just as we expected. And so you see for yourself how those integer fractions work out for GLONASS. And so now let's, um, oh, one more detail. I've uh, taken a screenshot of the beginning of that simulation. And just to, to show you the, the fine details, so there's 20th of August, 1900 is the start time. And there's eight days later, 28th of August, and it's eight sidereal days, so it's 24 hours minus eight times four minutes. So that's 32 minutes before 1900. And so those are screenshots from the simulation and let, so we can bring in a horizontal line and there you see the satellite back in the same place that it started. So now let's go look at the entire constellation and with the same way of tabulating the data as we did with GPS. 
And so with GLONASS, there are 24 satellites in the constellation, and it does have 24 operational satellites today. It's a operational constellation, fully operational. They're organized in three planes, with, of course, eight satellites per plane, as shown there. And then an interesting difference from GPS, they are inclined at 66 degrees to the equator so that the, tra the ground track over the Earth, or the point on the Earth directly beneath the satellite, goes up to 66 degrees north, naturally, because the Russian territory goes further north than the US territory. And so they're designing their system to be more tailored to their own territory. And you will see this as a common characteristic of the different uh, systems from the different regions. Um, we've talked in detail, of course, about the orbit period. And then another difference from GPS is that GLONASS has only one PRN code. With GPS, remember, we had a different PRN code for each satellite. And in fact, the satellites get known by their PRN codes 1 through 32. With GLONASS, each satellite transmits the same PRN code. And we tell the satellites apart because they're in different frequencies. And that's why we say FDMA, frequency division, multiple access. And that's how the, the GLONASS system is organized. Except for the future GLONASS system, known as GLONASS-K, it will be backwards compatible, so it will also support the FDMA, but it will have CDMA with code division of multiple access with different PRN codes. So future GLONASS is going to be more like GPS in, in that sense. And existing GLONASS has these different frequency bands, so which allows us now to sets us up to go look at the signal structure and the frequency spectrum for GLONASS. And we'll do that now. And so before, where we saw a sync function for GPS, what we see here is multiple sync functions over on the right here. And there are n, well, there are 14 of them. And the way they organize is there's a approximately a central frequency called at 1602 megahertz. So GLONASS L1 is centered at 1602. And then for the different satellites, they vary this number n from minus 7 to plus 6. So that's 14 total. And the, each of these n's gives you a different center frequency for a different satellite. So now you might think, OK, that's 14 satellites. How do they get 24? And the way they have 24 all separated is that satellites that are at opposite sides of the Earth, antipodal satellites, share the same frequency and of course, the same PRN code, because they all have the same PRN code. But you'll never see those two satellites at the same time. And so GLONASS takes advantage of that fact to have 14 different frequencies, yet support 24 different satellites. So that's on L1. They have a similar thing on L2. And so the center frequencies are spread across that band. And then GLONASS-K, the future uh, GLONASS satellites, will, will have a CDMA signal, which is so we'll have something like that shown in quadrature here. At the moment, there's only one GLONASS-K satellite. It supports L3, and it broadcasts a CDMA signal on L3 shown there. So for GLONASS, L3 is 1202 megahertz. And the center frequencies at L1 are still being decided. There's a lot of discussion going on amongst the different countries. Uh, there's a desire to have everybody at the same L1 as GPS, namely 1575.42 megahertz. And how to do that and not have everybody interfere with each other is one of the reasons these Bok codes that we talked about came into existence. And so you may see GLONASS K at the same L1 frequency of GPS, 1575.42 megahertz, sometime in the future. In the meantime, GLONASS is uh, at, a, at a higher frequency, because 1575, of course, would be right over here. And GLONASS is off to the right there and spread across several center frequencies. And then just like with GPS and any other system, a good place to go to find out the current state of the system is this GPS World Almanac site. So as I mentioned before, just Google GPS World Almanac, and you will find this. And they include in here which which satellite is in orbit, which orbital plane it is. And you'll see these numbers 1 through 3, because there's only three orbital planes. 
which frequency channel each of these satellites on. So you'll see these numbers here, minus 7 through plus 6. And, and again, the notes to tell you which ones are operational and which not, and which one and why. So sometimes, just like with GPS, a satellite's not operational, but it hasn't been retired yet. So by the way, when a satellite's retired, what happens to it is each satellite has a small amount of propellant in it to adjust its orbit if, if necessary, and, and in particular to adjust the pointing angle of the satellite. Remember from our uh, module four where we learned about the power transmission of the satellite. Satellite transmits an antenna beam directly at the Earth, and if a satellite slightly rotates for some reason, it needs to be rotated back, and so there's some propellant on the satellite to actually do that. And when a satellite is retired, it will be boosted up into a different orbit and it'll live there the rest of its life. Satellite dies and goes to heaven, if you like. So that's all the information about GPS uh, available on, on that site, about GLONASS, I mean. And what you'll see uh, by reading the notes is that there are 23 so-called GLONASS M satellites, which are the GLONASS satellites that support L1 and L2 that we've been talking about. And there's one GLONASS K, which is, which is backward compatible. So it supports what the GLONASS M satellites support, but it also has this CDMA frequency, uh, well, this signal at the L3 frequency with CDMA coding. And now if you want to dig into this much deeper, then you need the GLONASS interface control document. Remember we talked about the GPS interface specification, which published by the US Air Force and tells you in great detail everything we know about GPS. Well, with GLONASS, there's a similar thing. So if you just Google that, there's one. And because it's Russian, of course, there's one in Russian. And there's one in English, an English translation published by the by the, the Russian Space Agency.